Hello again, and welcome, indeed, to the top 30 games of the decade. We've had 70 of these things so far, as we count down the full top 100, but now we've only got 30 left. There are so many to go, but we're getting there. As always, these are my personal choices, the games that I have enjoyed the most over the last decade. I am very interested in hearing what some of your choices are, as well as some just general thoughts of how wrong you think I am, but be respectful please. And on that note, might as well jump straight into number 30. Stanley wondered aloud what exactly he was doing on the top 30 of a video game countdown list. It was an unusual situation to find himself in. Maybe it's because his game was a meta-commentary on the nature of game design itself. And just a bizarre, dark comedy experience in and of itself. And I'm going to stop doing this voice now. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is such a bizarre little game, Stanley Parable. It's, it's such a weird thing because each run of the game is only like a few minutes long. It's not a long game, like you could probably finish the entire game within just a matter of hours if you were trying to go for all the endings, because there are many, many endings. Because this is a game about choice, and whether or not those choices in games are as free as you think they are. It is just examining that whole nature of things. You have this narrator that constantly follows you around and kind of berates you for making the wrong choices and it goes into weird, weird places just constantly. It's such a funny game. Uh, it's such a simple game. It's such a simple game to play because it, you're just walking around occasionally interacting with things, but the game barely even lets you interact with things. But it just... it's so silly and it's so well written that as an experience it's just brilliant. So, of course, it gets to be one of the games of the decade because of just how unique and special it is. Celeste is a really, really hard game, but it manages to take that difficulty and handle it in such a way that it's not frustrating and that it makes sense for the story that it's trying to tell. So ultimately, Celeste is about a girl called Madeline who is trying to climb a mountain because of reasons. She just wants to do it so she can prove that she can because she has low self-esteem, she suffers from mental health issues, and by climbing this mountain it's kind of a way of proving to herself that she's capable more capable than she thinks she is and as such the game's difficulty shows that attempt to overcome insurmountable challenges or things that feel insurmountable but with that constant difficulty they've managed to play it up in a way of encouraging you to keep going to keep getting better to not give up which again works with that mental health theme the fact that it spawns you in like almost instantly on a one screen challenge so you never get set back too far on your progress the soundtrack being so chill keeps you in a nice sort of state of mind so you're not stressing out over it it's just such a really cool way of telling a story about mental health in a way because that's what it's about in a way that you wouldn't expect when you just see the gameplay it was all handled with such care and respect as well and the whole experience was really, really fun. It is one of the most challenging games I've ever played that I've barely ever gotten frustrated at. So for that alone, it's done really well. Oxenfree is a really weird game. It's a mind-bending narrative adventure game. Largely just kind of wandering around talking to people, choosing choices, 
the pop-up. I really like the dialogue system in this game, by the way. I'll get to some of the other aspects I like, but the dialogue system that just pops up with the bubbles while people are speaking so that so that you can like choose your responses. Sometimes the responses cut in, and it's not clear when they'll do that, but on the whole, it's just such a really neat little system that I felt was handled really nicely. It's just such a stylish, spooky game without being like overtly horror. It's a weird one. I really don't know how to explain it, but... It's really stylish with the use of radio effects. So you get a lot of static going on, but also kind of the supernatural force that exists on the island in this uh, that these teens have gone to. The supernatural force talks through radio messages, and the way it sort of pieces together its messages from like just assorted radio recordings. I just really like how they did that. It's always entertaining. The dialogue's entertaining. It's a little unrealistic, but it, it works for the game, and it in it, it manages to entertain and keep you going and it makes the characters kind of likeable anyway but yeah it's such a really interesting little experience and I think the developers just nailed that kind of spooky adventure vibe really really well and I need to get around to playing their more recent game because I hear that that's just as superb as Oxenfree Platinum Games make exactly one game, but that game is just superb because it is a crazy action game that's simple to pick up, hard to master, and is so over the top that you just can't help but be dragged along for the ride and laughing the entire time. But they are also really good at taking that formula and applying it in so many different ways. Metal Gear Rising is them taking that formula and putting it in the Metal Gear universe. Uh, so you control Raiden instead of Snake, which gives a really interesting take on the Metal Gear universe because you're not approaching it in a stealth manner anymore. You're not approaching it in a sort of, I'm a grizzled soldier taking down the bad guys. It's like, now I'm a cyborg ninja slashing through the enemies and there's all the blood everywhere. So much blood. And it's just such a good fun game. It is Platinum at their absolute crazy best. Uh, there's fluid combat, there's a wide array of moves in a way that you wouldn't think from the two button system that it uses, but it does have just a whole range of stuff. It's completely ridiculous. The fact that the game opens by you taking down a Metal Gear, which normally happens at the end of a Metal Gear game, and the fact that it, it leans into its own ridiculousness. The final boss fight is so... <laughs> so quotable, so memorable. The music just adds to that over the top atmosphere. Just everything about this is stylish. It's just, it's really well made. And it just, it's always fun to just come back and pick up and play and just try and improve your scores and try and get better. And it's such a really interesting take on the Metal Gear universe. So one of the ways that I've described Until Dawn in the past is that it's the greatest David Cage game because David Cage isn't involved. So it plays a lot like something like Heavy Rain or uh, Beyond Two Souls and that sort of thing. But where it differs is the fact that the people who wrote this game aren't hacks. Instead, the, the story, the narrative, is written by people who get horror as a genre, particularly American slasher flick type horror because this runs with all the tropes that you expect from that genre a bunch of teens go to a cabin up in the mountains bad things happen or people start dying it's horror it's spooky but it plays on all of those tropes it pretty much shoves every possible trope in that it could but it does so in a way that it also subverts some of them but maintains others how they should be and you never really know which way it's going to go it's so tense to play. Every choice feels like life or death, because in some cases it is, but you never really know which choices are. Obviously, if you look stuff up, then you'll find out, but if you don't and you just play it blind, 
you have that sort of tense nature of like, I don't know if this choice is going to mean anything or if this is going to get someone killed or whatever. And it's such a good horror game, but it's such a good narrative game at the same time, backed by just some brilliant performances across the board, including some fairly well-known actors like Hayden Patinier, and I've probably said her name wrong, and Rami Malek as well, he's in it. And yeah, it's just such a good game. And the, they, the characters are written smarter than they should be as well, which is surprising, while also still fitting into those archetypes. It's just such a brilliantly put together game. More teen-based, choice-driven narrative gaming here uh, with Life is Strange 2. You might be thinking, where's Life is Strange 1? We'll get to that one. That's coming later because I don't feel that Life is Strange 2 quite hit the same beats that the first game did, but it's still really good. Life is Strange 2 is built around the relationship between these two brothers. You've got Sean and Daniel, his young child brother. Sean is teenager about to move into adulthood, that sort of age. I think he is 18. But yeah, they, they're on the run because of a cop shooting their dad and Daniel having powers that killed the cop that killed their dad. And they are on the run and trying to avoid all that. And it's built around how Sean teaches Daniel on the road. You know, what, how he moulds him, how he treats him, how he shows him the world essentially and all of that's really done well but where it kind of falls down compared to the first game is because it's that road trip you're constantly moving from place to place so you never have that sort of set of people that you can build on relationships and learn more about the relationship stuff with your brother holds up really well and the fact that in the final episode all of your choices kind of culminate in how he behaves in the course of the adventure you can't control him but the choices you make throughout the story inform his behavior and I think that's really cool. I also just really like how it brought in a lot of the concerns and fears of non-white Americans. You know, it's kind of central to the story. It's it's built into the story and it's it's handled really well. Not that I'm really the best person to judge, I guess, but I just think it's a, a really good narrative adventure. And so we have another side to Platinum and their one game, except this time it's Bayonetta 2. You may as well throw in Bayonetta 1 as well, just because due to his weird release of coming out in 2009 in Japan and then coming out in 2010 in the UK, it could be included, but I didn't for that discrepancy, but feel free to include it here. But Bayonetta 2 is just another take on the Platinum formula. You've got your fast-paced combo, huge range of moves from a set of simplistic controls. It's, yeah, it's more platinum and it's awesome. Bayonetta 2 as well just really builds on everything that the first game did really well. The first game, absolutely fantastic action game, loads of stuff going on, and Bayonetta 2 just builds on everything. It's got a story that's a little bit more focused, still completely ridiculous and over the top, and it's great but it makes a little bit more sense this time around, I feel. It looks much better than its predecessor due to the simple fact that it's got a much wider color palette than the first game, which was often quite drab. This one, really vibrant. It's just such a great improvement on an already excellent game. And how can you not like Bayonetta? As a character, she's great. And just the game is so much fun. It's so over the top. And... It's just it's another one that you can just jump in and have a blast with in short bursts. And yeah, I absolutely love it. It's amazing. Bayonetta 2. Good. Dishonored is such an interesting game. On the surface, it looks just like a drab, boring, kind of standard game. But then when you delve into it, and you start learning a bit more about it, you find that it's just this tense, moody stealth game 
set in a world that's just fascinating. You've got the plagues, you've got the whales, you've got the void going on, all of this weird stuff. It's a weird, it's a slightly terrifying world and a really weird world, but it's one that you kind of want to learn more about. And within that, you've got this game that's fundamentally a stealth game, but there are such a range of options in achieving your goals. So you can go out and kill people, or you can put them through things to stop them from doing what they're doing in non-lethal ways, but in often slightly worse ways than killing them? I don't know. It's got delightfully weird art design. Everyone's got massive hands, I don't understand that, but it's it's kind of weirdly charming. Also, everyone is going for whiskey and cigars tonight, I believe so. It's just such a bizarre experience, but it's so slick and so well made. Maneuvering through the levels is so satisfying. Figuring your way out and just everything feels like a puzzle and it's it just all kind of cum culminates in this really, really cool experience that I absolutely loved. So I mentioned not liking Kratos as a character. God of War 2018 did something that I thought was impossible for that series. It made me like Kratos. It made me sympathize with him as a character because the writing in this game is so good. And it tells the story of a man who knows how much his rage cost him and is doing his best to overcome that rage, but it is part of who he is and it's a constant struggle of dealing with that, especially as he's trying to be a role model to his son, but he also is reluctant to do that because of his rage and all the rest of it. It's it's such a really good exploration of a character who's trying their best to change despite all the odds. But beyond that, it's also just a really, really fun action adventure game. It's not quite as combat focused as the original trilogy. There's still some really excellent combat, but now there's also more exploration and world building and taking time to take in your scenery and figure out what's going on around you and it makes for a much more mature much more enjoyable game I absolutely loved God of War 2018 I think it was absolutely the correct direction to take the series in after it had just become cartoonishly silly with the original trilogy but this is like very mature and much stronger for it even though Kratos does say boy a ridiculous amount of times Castlevania Symphony of the Night is one of the greatest games ever made. That's not a controversial opinion. It shouldn't be. I'm sure someone will violently disagree with me, but okay. Bloodstained is just Symphony of the Night again, but modern, but also just still just Symphony of the Night again. It's Koji Igarashi setting out on his own after frustrations with Konami, not getting to make the Castlevania games he wanted to make, and he basically just made a Castlevania game. A superb Castlevania game. It has all the stuff that makes those sorts of Castlevania games good. It's its own thing, while also simultaneously really not being its own thing. One thing I absolutely love about Bloodstained is just how unashamedly it throws out nods to Castlevania and somehow gets away with it. So you've got things like a villager who will ask you to go out and avenge people who died by killing demons within the big spooky castle and you've got the names of people you're avenging are all Castlevania characters it's Simon and Trevor and Richter and all this kind of stuff is on there you've got uh, a character who literally has the voice actor of Alucard from Symphony of the Night and in, in a in a setting that's almost identical to that game as well and I'm like how the hell did you get away with this? But I'm loving this. But on top of that, it's just, it is a solid Metroidvania in every possible way. I had a blast with this game and I want more of it, quite frankly. It's 
so good. I think the only real letdown is just how short it, the experience is. And I think a sequel with more of this would would be absolutely welcome. And that is it for another set of 10 games in this top 100 countdown as we count down all the best games of the decade, in my opinion. Tomorrow, we start the top 20 and kick that off. We're getting there. We're almost there. We're almost through it. So let me know your thoughts on what games I've selected so far. And also, let me know some of uh, your personal favourites of the decade. And I'll see you again tomorrow with number 20.